13th century, that most Catholic of all centuries, was perhaps the greatest pope of the Middle Ages, and certainly one of the greatest popes of all time. Innocent III, who sat in St. Peter's chair from 1198 until 1216. During his pontificate, among other things, he proclaimed the Fourth Crusade. He approved of a band of begging brothers founded by a man named Francis, St. Francis. And he convened the great Fourth Lateran Council in 1215 to, quote, deliberate on the improvement of morals, the extinction of heresy, and the strengthening of the faith, close quote. On July 16, 1216, at the relatively young age of 56, he died of a fever near Rome. Within three days, the cardinals had chosen another man, Honorius III, to be his successor as the Pope. Honorius took Innocent III as his model for the papacy, regarding him as an inspired leader of Christendom and as a saintly and holy Pope. Far away in the Netherlands, on the very day that Pope Innocent died, St. Lugarda of Bradmont was praying in her convent when suddenly she was surprised to see a man completely enveloped in flames appear before her, right there in the convent. Who are you and what do you want? She demanded of him. I'm Pope Innocent, he said. Holy Father, how is it possible that you should be in such a state? I'm expiating three faults, which he told her, but as her biographer, who had spoke to her about this, noted, I omit them here through respect for so great a pope. I'm expiating three faults, which might have caused my eternal damnation. But thanks to the Blessed Virgin Mary, I have obtained pardon for them, but I have to make atonement. It is terrible, and it will last for centuries unless you come to my assistance. In the name of Mary, who has obtained for me the favor of appealing to you, help me. And then he disappeared. The Pope disappeared after he said that his purgatory time was terrible and it would last for centuries. St. Lugarda announced the death of the Pope to her sisters and they began prayers and works of penance to deliver him from purgatory. Some weeks later, the news from Rome, the fact that the Pope had died, finally arrived through normal channels at the convent. A great Pope, widely regarded as saintly, and yet his purgatory time would have lasted for centuries had St. Lugard and her sisters not come to his aid. Centuries for three falls. St. Francis of Rome says on average it takes seven years in purgatory to make expiation for each forgiven mortal sin. Seven years. That great doctor of the church, St. Robert Bellarmine, says there's no doubt that the pains of purgatory are not limited to 10 or 20 years, and they last, in some cases, entire centuries. The last great Thomistic theologian, Father Reginald Mar Marie Garigou Lagrange, taught, quote, theological opinion in general favors long duration of purgatorial purification. Private revelations mention three or four centuries or even more, especially for those who have had high office and great responsibility. Close quote. Actually, I could spend this whole sermon multiplying these cases. I'll mention one more. We're all familiar with the story of Fatima and how the children asked the Blessed Virgin about a young teenage girl in their village who had died. What was her fate? She said she was saved but that she would spend her time in purgatory until the end of the world. Of course, all souls in purgatory have to be out by the end of the world since purgatory ends on Judgment Day. Father, this seems incredible. It does seem that way. And if we just stopped there, we'd probably all fall into terrible despair. But hang on. We'll stop and take some looks look at some of the truths about purgatory and then we'll be able to put it all into a clearer perspective. Truths about purgatory. First, purgatory is the place where the members of the church suffering live. 
They're commonly called the poor souls, or sometimes the holy souls. The souls in purgatory died in the state of grace, so they're all saved. But these souls cannot yet enter heaven because they still have to make amends. So purgatory is the place where souls make amends, and that's an easy concept to understand. It's like summer school for heaven. You didn't flunk, but you didn't quite pass either. So God, being infinitely merciful, has a good deal. Point two. This point has two truths which we must simultaneously hold. Purgatory is a place of joy and peace, while at the same time is a place of great suffering. Joy and peace and suffering. St. Catherine of Genoa, who dictated her treatise on purgatory while she was in ecstasy and while she was experiencing the sufferings of purgatory, commented on these very truths. She said that the poor souls enjoy an inexpressible peace which is compounded of joy and pain. No peace can be compared with the peace in purgatory except for the peace in heaven. Where's the pain from then? God increases in these poor souls a desire to see them. And that desire becomes so strong to have the beatific vision that we talked about Friday night that it becomes absolutely unbearable. They love God. They want to see Him in the worst possible way. But they can't yet. Third point, there are two pains in purgatory, the delay of the beatific vision and the pain of sense. As we've just seen, the delay of the beatific vision is a chief pain in purgatory. Why? Because the souls love God above all things. So on one hand, they're full of joy in the hope of being delivered soon from purgatory, but on the other hand, they're in an agony of suffering from not being able to see God face to face. And this is real suffering. According to St. Augustine, St. Isidore, St. Bonaventure, and St. Robert Bellamy, the least pain in purgatory is worse than the greatest pains on earth. The least pain in purgatory is worse than the greatest pains on earth. And St. Catherine of Genoa, who experienced those pains again, said, Souls in purgatory unite great joy with great suffering. One does not diminish the other. They endure torments which no tongue can describe and no intelligence can comprehend without a special revelation. That's the pain of uh, the loss of the beatific vision, not the loss, but the delay. The pain of sense, according to the teaching of St. Gregory the Great, St. Augustine, St. Cypriel, St. Basil, St. Robert Bellarmine, all doctors of the Church, and the experience of the many saints who have visited purgatory is caused by the purgatorial fire which is cleansing those souls of their imperfections. So the two pains are from the delay in being able to see the beatific vision and the purgatorial fire. Fourth point, there are three reasons that souls get detained in purgatory. First, they're making amends for sins, either mortal or venial, that have been forgiven, but they haven't made complete satisfaction for before they die. What does that mean? Actually, that's a pretty basic concept, too. The virtue and justice of justice considers in rendering another what's his due. It just means pay what you owe. So if we steal our neighbor's lawnmower, and then we repent, go over and ask him if he'll forgive us, we've been forgiven, but there's something else we have to do. We have to bring the lawnmower back. Okay? If we violate the virtue of justice, we haven't rendered unto God what is his due, which is absolute obedience when we commit a sin. So we've tipped the scale to justice. So if we repent, that's one thing, but then we have to make reparation to balance out the scales again. And if we repent before we die, we're going to be all right. If it's a mortal sin and we don't repent, we know what that means. But supposing we do repent before we die, but we haven't made restitution, well, that's purgatory. So the balance still has to be even. That's why we do penance. That's why we give all. We want to even out the balance so we can reduce our time here in this life, okay? Now, before we go on, let's consider something we've already heard in light of this fact. St. Francis of Rome said on average, it takes seven years in purgatory to make expiation for each forgiven mortal sin. Well, now maybe you can see clearly why the Catholics in the old days wanted like the world's most mega penances when they went to confession. Why? So that they got their penance done here and not hereafter. That's why a priest could tell you, you can ask for more penance in the confessional. 
he might fall over, but look, all other things being the same. The penance you get in confession. Suppose that you got ten Hail Marys in confessional or you decided to do ten Hail Marys on your own. Because it's attached to the sacrament, it has way more value for you. So if you can't ask for more, I mean, uh, some priests will be happy to give you more. They'll ask you if that's enough. It's not picking on you. It's for your own good. Penance is good. We want to do it now. Okay? So, St. Thomas of Villanova, in fact, urges confessors to give their penitents optional penances. An optional penance is something they don't have to do, but if they do do it, it gets them out of purgatory time, besides the fact they're growing in holiness. And this is a good thing. And because it's optional, they're, there's no, they're not bound under the pain of sin. And that way, if they don't get it done, they're safe. So they're not piling anything on, you know, because we have to do our penances if they're bound. But if they're optional, we don't. Okay? So, the first reason that souls are in purgatory is they're making amends for their sins which have been forgiven, but they hadn't made satisfaction for in this life. Second reason, they're also there because they've died with unforgiven venial sins. Venial sins for which they must render an account. Remember, venial sins don't merit damnation, but they pile on the purgatory time. Can't get to heaven until every penny's been paid. Third, souls are also detained in purgatory because even though their sins have been forgiven, these souls still have what are called the remains of sin when they die. What are the remains of sin? St. Thomas points out there are two problems with any sin. One is the sinner turns away from God, and others he turns towards a creature. For example, in the case of a dope smoker, a guy knows darn good and well it's wrong, he decides to do something wrong. That's the turning away from God. He turns towards the marijuana. That's the creature. Now assume this man got the grace to repent. Since it's a mortal sin, the crime of turning away from God is forgiven when he makes a good confession. But, and this is super important to know, it's super important to know, there may very well remain in his soul an attraction still towards that marijuana, an attraction, an inclination to fall into that same sin. That's one of the punishments for sin, is we've wounded ourselves, and then we're attracted towards that sin again. God said, no, you had a better idea. Okay, you're going to be hurt, and you are hurt. We all know that. That's the problem. Those, those attractions or inclinations towards sin are a danger to our salvation in the first place. But supposing we make it and we die in a state of grace, all that has to go. That continuing lack of virtue in a man's soul is what we call the remains of sin. It has to go before you get into heaven. This is why it's so important to work on your virtues. If you get your virtues in order, it roots out the vices. Either you have virtues or vices. The virtues will praise the vices. We're going through a series of virtues, one a month. Work on them. Those will help root out the remains of sin. The whole idea here is so everybody gets and goes to heaven. I'm going to make a parenthetical comment. God sends us everything we need to die and go straight to heaven. Exactly the amount of suffering we need to make amends for everything. Exactly the amount of suffering we need to grow in virtue. And if we don't, that's our own fault. That's the point of the cross. That's why we have crosses in our life. So we'll become saints. See, reality, God made reality, and Adam has put us in a position where we're going to have a hard time weaving our way through it. It's hard. But so God, in his mercy, makes sure we have these opportunities to grow in virtue and conquer the vice so we can get to heaven. But if we don't, if we don't take advantage of the confessional, the blessed sacrament, the sacraments of the church, our prayer life, and so forth, there's no one to blame. There's no one to blame. God will do everything possible to get us to heaven. He doesn't want anybody to go to purgatory. Okay? All right. So, the three reasons, again, for being in purgatory are making amends for sins, either mortal or venial, which have been forgiven, but reparation hasn't been completed, dying with unforgiven venial sins, or still having the remains of sin when a person dies. Fifth point. A Lord, our Lord meant exactly what he said when he said that we wouldn't get out till we paid the last penny. No one with the slightest speck of imperfection can enter heaven. The poor souls don't want to enter heaven yet until they're purified. But that doesn't mean they don't, they don't want to be purified. They want to be purified, and they want to be purified right now. Sixth point, souls in purgatory can't merit. The time for merit is in this life. At death, meriting ends, period. What does merit mean? It means we can grow in grace. We can grow in grace now, but not after we die. It ends right then. That's the cutoff. 
Seventh point, as we've already said, God sends us exactly the right amount of suffering in this life we need to avoid purgatory and die and go straight to heaven. That's his plan. If we don't do it, that's our own incompetence. Eighth point, we can offer up our prayers and good works for the poor souls. And this is critical. If anybody is interiorly feeling sorry for themselves right now, thinking about centuries of purgatory, seven years for every forgiven mortal sin, all that, spit out your thumb. You're standing there with the ladders and the ropes in your hands, and there's people that are frying right now. What are you going to do about them? Don't worry about you. Worry about them. That's what we're going to talk about here, okay? If we're taking care of them, God is instantly just, is going to take care of us. We get first dibs on all the stuff if we fall into there, okay? That's how it works. The saints are helping us. We're supposed to help out the poor souls. If we're sitting here feeling sorry for ourselves, that is immaturity. Catholicism is about growing up, spitting out your thumb, and getting used to reality. And reality hurts. My job as a priest is to tell you things you don't want to hear. I'm going to do it. Okay, if we're serious about helping these out, we should be getting indulgences. We should go for a plenary indulgence every doggone day and be offering that up. I spoke about that yesterday. You can look at the card to get more information about it. Have masses said for the poor souls. Offer up your intentions at Mass on occasion for the poor soul most in need of it, those poor souls you're most bound to pray for, or whatever, but pray for the poor souls. Make communions for the poor souls. They can't help themselves, but you can help them. We're the ones that can do something about it. We can offer up our sufferings and our sickness for the poor souls. That is better than offering it up for sinners. I know that sounds funny, but it isn't. Sinners can help themselves. Poor souls can't. We can help them. A sinner can't, can help himself. We can give alms. Okay? Put another point in perspective then. Why do you think Innocent III appeared to St. Lutgarda? He wasn't sneaking out of purgatory. God allows an apparition like this for at least three reasons. What are the reasons? First, to remind us that he means what he says. If he said we have to answer for every idle word, he meant it. He doesn't have a better idea, he already knows everything, and he doesn't forget anything. If he says something, that's how it is. Sin will be punished, either in this life or the next, period. It will be punished. We're at war with sin. If we're not at war with sin, we're not seeing reality. We're at war with sin. It's pay now or pay later. That might not be comfortable, but that's reality. Second, why do an apparition like that? To remind us to pray and sacrifice, to get our brothers out of purgatory. And guess what? If we're doing that, we're going to start crushing that self-love in our own souls. We'll be growing in holiness. If you're trying to get indulgence every day, the reason for having indulgence is in the way that... It's not like the popes are bored to say, well, we'll make this an indulgence. It's to make you grow in holiness. So if you're trying to get an indulgence every day, you're going to be so much more holy that you're just going to waltz into heaven or go waltz into purgatory compared to what would have happened if you weren't doing that. Okay. Third, God allows these kind of apparitions... Because not only is he infinitely just, which is easy to forget nowadays where everything is so nice, but he's infinitely merciful. Even though Innocent III was sentenced to centuries in purgatory for these three small faults, God allowed him to appear in a convent headed by a saint with a bunch of really serious sisters. Why? So Innocent III wouldn't have to serve his sentence. He got the sentence, but St. Luke Garda and whatnot, they're praying him up. That's our job, so that they don't have to serve their sentences. We can get them out. Instead of feeling sorry for ourselves, throw those ropes into purgatory and start yanking people out every day, okay? All right. So there's every reason to believe the times in purgatory are long. Decades or centuries long. But thanks be to God, there's another solution that each one of us have. I'm going to tell you about it right now. You can look it up if you have the glories of Mary at St. Alphonsus, Doctor of the Church. I'll just read from you something that came from the National Scapular Center in 1986. Two wonderful promises of Our Lady are available to those who have been enrolled in the Brown Scapular. Enrollment is a simple procedure. Ask me. I know how. The great promise of the Blessed Virgin Mary was given to St. Simon Stock July 16, 1251, is as follows. Whoever dies wearing the scapular shall not suffer eternal fire. That's hell. Her second promise has to do with purgatory. It's known as the Sabbatine privilege. It was given by the Blessed Mother to Pope John the 22nd in the year 1322 and is as follows. Quote, I, 
the mother of grace, shall descend on the Saturday after their death, and whomsoever I shall find in purgatory, I shall free. Now there are three conditions for obtaining that privilege to get out of purgatory on the next Saturday. Hang with me, though, because one of them will shock you. One, you have to wear the scapular. Two, you have to pray, practice chastity according to your state and life. And three, the daily recitation of the little office of the Blessed Virgin Mary. That's like a little breviary. However, any priest who has diocesan faculties has the additional facility to commute the third requirement, which is saying the little office, to another pious work. Therefore, everybody that is enrolled in the Brown Scapular, by an act of my will right now, all you who are present, I hereby commute that obligation to the daily rosary. I can do that, and I have just done that. If you are enrolled in the scapular, then you wear your scapular, practice chastity according to your state life, and say the daily rosary, you are meriting the sabotage privilege. Okay. So, the Blessed Mother comes through again. God sends her down here to make sure that we don't forget how merciful he is, that even though we deserve all this purgatory time, I mean, he came down and died for us to keep us from going to hell. He sent his mother down to keep us from spending much time in purgatory. So even if we get centuries worth on that, if we're working on helping out the people that can't help themselves, if we're serious about praying for the poor souls, if we're living chastity according to our state and life, wearing a bronze scapular and saying our rosary daily, instead of decades or centuries of purgatory, we don't have more than a week. It's a pretty good deal. But remember, it's pay now or pay later.